Okay, thank you, Bettina, and also from me, uh, a warm welcome. Good afternoon. Um, as Bettina said, we're going to kick off with the uh, obligatory uh, looking backwards before going then forwards into the strategy uh, 2020 plus. So some of these slides are redundant. I think you know who we are and you've seen this uh, live, so we'll skip that one. Um, introduction. So beginning with, um, you know, year end 2019, uh, four check marks. We made it. Huh? So. I think uh, people had some doubt uh, during the middle of the year, uh, even after Q3. Uh, I must say it was a little bit nail-biting to some extent, but we made uh, all of our um, targets. We delivered on our outlook. 6% uh, organic growth, 6% uh, last year too, so two years in a row, 6% against a uh, strategy of five, so a little bit ahead of uh, plan in terms of the revenue. The uh, EBITDA, um, significant increase, so from 65 last year to uh, 104 this year, that's a 65% uh, organic growth. Again, check the box. Net profit, uh, same as last year, except now there's a plus rather than the minus, so we're at uh, plus 24. That's good because it's the first time since 2016 uh, that we have turned a net profit, and of course, 16 was heavily influenced positively by the sale of Apleona. And the last of our uh, key milestones there, uh, free cash flow reported. So reported uh, rather than adjusted uh, at 57. So again, uh, check the box. So we made, as I said, all of our commitments for 2019. Looking a little bit further at the, um, uh, the headlines, um, orders received. Um, that's probably the only kind of mar on the uh, copybook. So we're 4% down on uh, 2018. Um, You've heard the story, we're going to repeat it several times, you know, we're not worried, uh, not at all. Uh, we can explain it, these are a couple of major orders, and major really does mean major, uh, which were moved uh, from 19 into 20. So we're still feeling very confident on the top line, both order intakes and uh, revenue, as you'll see in our planning going forward. Uh, as I said already, um, you know, the full year revenue was good, 6% up, Q4 slightly down. Uh, again, not concerned, to be honest. Uh, EBITDA, tremendous improvement. We're at 2.4. Uh, we'd like to be in a little bit higher. Um, when I say like to have been, that's when we entered into this in 2017. Uh, but I think uh, we, we made our plan, we made our budget, and, uh, you know, again, a great uh, thank you to the Bilfinger team out there, hopefully watching this as well. And then finally, uh, net profit, you know, we had a real turbo close to the year, as you can see, they're 15 million, so a total of 24 for the year. If you look at our liquidity, um, you know, again, um, reported uh, free cash flow there at uh, plus 57. Uh, a lot of that was driven by uh, working capital improvements, especially DSO. Uh, DSO is always one of those things where, you know, you have this year-end push, our challenge is to get that more even through the year, um, which of course will improve our liquidity, but also here, the guys and girls did a great job uh, 10 days down in Q4 and delivering then a solid reported positive uh, free cash flow. The balance sheet uh, remains strong. Um, you followed the recapitalization, the payback of the bond during the course of the year. And with that strong balance sheet, with the performance that we delivered, uh, we are going to recommend a uh, one euro dividend uh, per share, as we did in the prior years. Uh, that recommendation goes to the board, and of course the board then puts it to the um, uh, AGM in April. Uh, but again, we're feeling confident about our balance sheet, not only today, but also forward, and therefore we maintain the one euro dividend floor. Our outlook uh, for the coming year um, hasn't changed since the last time we talked about this at the end of Q3. Uh, revenue uh, will be relatively flat, uh, maybe some upside, but uh, flat because, again, you know, we're living off the backlog. We see what's happening. As the backlog grows, uh, we're feeling even more confident on uh, 2021. But for now, we're forecasting um, steady uh, revenue. Uh, we are forecasting a substantial increase in the uh, EBITDA, so from the, the 2.4 that we achieved in 2019 to around about 4% in 2020, and then we will continue to grow going forward, but that's the, the next section. 
Uh, finally, uh, likewise, uh, that uh, improved operating performance uh, is not only reflected in EBITDA, but also then in cash flow. I'm being fairly quick, because I think you know the numbers, and I'm going to hand over to Christina to begin to walk us through the details. Thank you, Tom. Also, a warm welcome from my side. Um, and uh, I would like to present, first of all, 2019, a little bit more on 2020. Starting off then with the orders received, um, and the picture at the end of the year is fairly similar to what we have seen during the last quarters. In total, we are finalizing uh, the order intake at a level of 4159, which organically is 4% below what we had in a very, very good year 2018. Um, we clearly see that, especially in the segment technologies, but also partly in E&M International, that we are a bit weaker than we planned and expected and wanted. But its major um, driver behind that is a number um, of projects that time-wise will go into 2020 for order intake. And I'm also very happy to say that out of these few number but large size projects, a couple of them have now been moving forward in January and February. So one of these projects that we expected in the order intake last year is a project with a German subsidiary of BP, um, Ruhr Öl. And in this case, we have now been commissioned to do engineering, procurement, and installation of pipes and pipes racks at their refinery in Gelsenkirchen. So this is... Uh, size um, in um, above 100 million order intake, and that we will see in quarter one. We will also hear more about Hinkley Point, where we also in quarter one now finally will have the first sizable order intake. But obviously, um, these orders were missing in the closing of 2019, but looking then at the weakness in technologies we will make up for in the first quarter 2020 in North America, it will still require a couple of months to pick up on this. I think uh, this is not a concern for us um, looking forward. Looking at uh, the book to bill, we closed at one, and looking at the order backlog, we here are closing organically 7% below the very strong level that we had when we started 2019. Then proceeding to the revenue line. As Tom said, um, we managed to achieve an organic growth of 6%, um, even above our expectation in 2019, the second year in a row with this organic growth. Um, we managed to take the EBITDA adjusted up to the level of 104 million from 65 in previous year. Um, and we also had a similar number for the adjustment, 72 million in 2018, also 72 million in 2019, but brought the reported EBITDA to 32 million in 2019. In the 72 million of adjustments, the two major positions being the IT rollout, our system harmonization that we have been working on for a number of years, um, and we will finalize in quarter one, 2021. So we will also see a number here, and we'll show it later in the presentation, for adjustments on the system harmonization coming through in our guidance for 2020. Um, and then a very small number in the first quarter of 2021. In addition to that, 40 million of restructuring expense. And after our announcement of the quarter three, we obviously were increasing this number. So we now have also covered for the sub seven, the latest restructuring program that we have initiated in last year. Um, so all the cost for driving this SGNA um, program further down has been covered with provisions in 2019. Obviously, the cash out would, to a large extent, only follow in 2020. So 40 million is that, and a bit more than 30 million coming from system harmonization. Um, then looking at the two main drivers for the improvement that we have achieved, but also above all the improvements that we intend to achieve in 2020 and 2021 to bring 
Billfinger up to the sustainable EBITDA, and I say deliberately EBITDA, not adjusted, not reported, one EBITDA of 5% in 2021. The first one being the gross margin. And I like to be transparent because I know that you see everything that we see. Looking at the gross margin developments over the last years, um, we achieved an improvement in the last quarter. So we closed the last quarter with 11.3%, a significant improvement versus the last quarter in 2018. But looking at the full year, we are only at 9.5%, so a small improvement versus 2018, um, which was 9.4%. Um, in this area, we see most of the improvement that needs to take place. And we also will hear, especially from Duncan later on, what we are going to do to bring this 9.5% in the next coming two years up to the level of 12%. You will also see later on that a, a big part of our business today is already at 12%. We just need to make sure that the remaining part of the business will improve to also make sure that we in total get to the 12%. So operating margin or gross margin improvement visible in quarter four, but a big step up required here in the next coming two years. The second um, most important lever is then the SGNA ratio. Here we have over the last years proven that we are able to reduce this. We have closed 2019 with a ratio of 8% um, versus the year before, 87 starting off with above 10% in 2016. So year by year, a clear improvement and a good track record. Um, and we will continue this journey uh, with the restructuring program announced in autumn last year. We will bring this ratio now with a flat uh, top line down to 7.5% in 2020 and then down to 7% in 2021. And then trying to target, even if we start to grow again, to stay below the 7%. Um, so these two, SGNA ratio and the operating margin being the most important steps forward to make sure that we move on this journey from 2.4% to hopefully above 5%. Looking at the uh, three segments that we are reporting externally. First of all, the larger segment, which is engineering and maintenance, e and Europe. Um, another year of a very sound performance throughout the year. Um, this part also making sure that we, during this year of 2019, were able to make up for the downside that is visible in technologies. So e and Europe bringing more to the table than we originally expected to make sure that we are keeping the promise for the whole group. Um, looking at orders received slightly below, organically a decrease for the year of 5%. However, we have here also the effect that I mentioned, Hinkley Point, but also the BP project in Gelsenkirchen that partly will bring a benefit to technologies, but also e and Euro Europe units being involved. So with the strong order intake in quarter one, we are not concerned about the workload in e and Europe for 2020. Book to bill, still closing at one. Revenue, an organic increase in 2019 of 2 uh, to 3%, and EBITDA adjusted, closed at 101 million, which is in line with previous year, a 3.7% um, margin on EBITDA adjusted. So solid performance, continuous improvement, but we still see potential here for further growth, but also for further profit improvement. Um, so for 2020, our guidance for e and Europe is a fairly stable revenue development, but a significant positive development of EBITDA adjusted. And that is, of course, a stronger focus on continuous improvement, but it's also the mix. 
we have a large number of what we call in building year turnarounds, larger revisions in the maintenance business. These are normally generating a very solid and good profitability, and we have increasingly for the next coming two years more and more turnarounds that also will pay back in the segment of ENM Europe. I also would like to mention that leaving 2019 going into 2020, we have four legal entities in ENM Europe that we have strategically decided that they don't fit in our portfolio and they will be transferred into the segment OOP from January 2020. That represents a sales of approximately 200 million and an EBITDA adjusted of around 5 million. The performance though, the 5 million that low in 2019 was hit with some one-time costs. So four legal entities moving on and having an impact of 200 million sales less in 2020. Moving on to the second part of ENM, ENM International, where North America is the larger part of this. Um, in this part, we were extremely happy with the developments. We had a strong organic growth in sales, revenue organically increasing with 15%, thanks to US and some very successful projects. We managed to get to an EBITDA adjusted of 42 million, so 10 million more than in previous year, a ratio of 4.6%. So a very, very strong performance, especially in North America in 2019. Um, and looking into 2020, given what I mentioned in regard of the order books, that North America, especially when it comes to the project business, has got some time delay here before the next larger project started. We are expecting that the top line that was achieved in 2019 will not be possible. So we will have a slight decrease in revenue due to the order book situation in North America. But we expect nonetheless an improvement in regard of the EBITDA further, um, especially coming from the Middle East, continuous improvement, but also a more, more favorable portfolio. Last but not least, our problem child, technologies, that uh, we already, after quarter one last year, had quite in detail to explain what is happening. Segment technologies with five legal entities have in 2019 had a difficult journey. Three entities not generating poor performance. I, I stress that three entities were profitable and uh, meeting the expectations for the year of 2019, even if we expect more growth and more profitability also from these three entities. But two legal entities being in focus, one hurting us badly in the first half and in the second half, the second entity. This has been a difficult journey in technologies and I confess that we, after quarter three, jointly still expected that the final result in technologies would it still be at least better than in 2018, where we had a loss of 26 million. But some happenings on some of the projects, and also the need to take some additional provisions here, to be cautious, um, we were forced to say Minus 28 million is the result of technologies in 2019, so not satisfacting, satisfactory at all. I think it is important to isolate these two entities, and I know that Duncan will also speak a bit more about what additional actions we have taken now to make sure that this story will not repeat in 2020. The first one, we started to stabilize in quarter three and four, and actually had losses in quarter three and four, but very small losses. The whole segment of technology was, however, profitable in the last quarter of 2019, but it was less profitable than we had forecasted due to one legal entity and a couple of projects. Now looking into 2020, 
and with this track record, it's difficult, I think, to convince you that a problem that we have now had for a number of years, we are really going to be able to turn around in 2020. We are ex expecting, not the least, also thanks to a very good order intake in January, a significant increase in revenue here and a positive result for EBITDA adjusted. And that goes back to turning these two remaining two legal entities around and making sure that we at least get them to break even in 2020. But we're coming back more to some insight on the reasons behind it and also additional actions that we have taken. Strong cash generation, especially in the last quarter, as Tom mentioned, between September and December, we reduced the DSO with 10 days. Um, so very, very strong movement forward here. Um, a pity that that movement is not coming during the year. We have a track record here of being very, very strong also in the cash generation in the last quarter. What are we doing about that? We are actually changing our incentive system for 2020 so that we stop measuring cash flow only by the end of the year and we will now measure it quarter by quarter to also make sure that we have the maximum effort earlier during the year to drive the cash flow. Looking at the adjusted operating cash flow here, um, we are achieving a clear improvement for the year 181 versus 110 in previous year. Um, a strong positive step forward. However, it doesn't mean that we are happy with the cash generation. Also during the next coming years we need here to make sure that we are moving forward and reducing the working capital, improving the EBITDA to support the cash, but also making sure that these adjustments are not happening anymore, that we don't need further restructuring, that we don't need any kind of adjustments because that's also having an extreme impact on the cash flow generated. You see the net trade asset. Um, I don't need to talk about that. On the net profit side, you see the net profit the swing from minus 24 in 18 to plus 24 in 19, and the adjusted net profit moving up from 36 to 49. So also here, a very strong performance in the last quarter. Not good enough, we will continue to drive this topic. Last but not least, the outlook for 2020, confirming what also Tom said before and we already announced after quarter three, we are expecting on the basis of our existing backlog and top line that is flat, so organically stable. We are expecting that the EBITDA adjusted will move up to around 4% in 2020, so a big step up from 2.4%. And in regard of the free cash flow reported, um, our guidance is a significantly positive development. With that, I would like to pass on to Tom again. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, you know, we commented on our results as well, pleased but not yet satisfied. Um, I think, again, when you look at the, the hit we took on T and the fact that we made our uh, forecast, um, you know, that shows you that we are robust. You know, we are able to take some blows along the way and still deliver on our commitment. And I think that's really the, the message uh, to take away going forward also. Which is what we're going to do now. We're going to move into the forward-looking part, into the um, strategy. And I think the best place to uh, start the strategy going forward is kind of where we began with the strategy in um, 2017, February 14, 2017, to be precise. At that time, this is the picture we showed you, so no change. Um, what is interesting is that uh, at the beginning of uh, 2019, uh, Christina, new on board, said, you know, convince me the strategy still holds. So we actually had uh, quite a few sessions early on in the year uh, testing our assumptions. And bottom line is, yes, it does hold. We're going to show you why. And at the time, we told you 246, so two segments, uh, four regions, uh, six key industries, and then the recipe to win through our people, customers, innovation, 
organization structures and delivering on the financials. That really hasn't changed. We showed you at the time as well the um, three horizons. Uh, in the stabilization phase, you know, that was 2017. We had uh, one legacy project then that really took us down. We made a, a profit warning in uh, Q2 of 2017. Uh, since then, we've stabilized. And as I said, you know, events such as happened in T, although they you know, set us back, they don't knock us over. We still deliver to our commitments, and I think that's our mantra going forward. We deliver to our commitments. We've gone through the stabilization phase. Uh, all of those lines have a check mark beside them. We did the same on the build-up phase. And now what's left ahead of us, uh, with a little bit of delay, but it's still ahead of us, is the build-out phase. And the build-out phase, um, you know, when I look at that, um, you know, the first question you ask, well, you know, what did you make in between? What did you miss? And uh, just summarizing, you know, where we wanted to be at the end of um, 19, where we committed to be at the end of uh, 20. And this is, again, going back to our original February 14, 2017 uh, capital market day, we said we would grow the top line on the base of 2017 at uh, a CAGR of 5%. Okay, you've seen we're growing at uh, 6%, a little bit stronger than that. Uh, but again, you know, give ourselves a check mark, uh, that one we achieved, and I think we'll continue to do so going forward after a pause on the order intake 19 converting into revenue in 20 for good reasons. On the gross margin, um, you know, we failed. You know, quite frankly, we failed. We said a 200 uh, bips uh, pickup uh, were more or less at zero. There's a nice trend that Christina just showed you in Q4 and a smidgen of a trend on 19 over 18. But uh, you know, we, we face it, uh, we haven't delivered there. Um, there have been headwinds against us, but you know, we're not gonna sit here and moan about the past. We're gonna look forward and that really is our major target, uh, our major to-do, and we're going to explain to you how we're going to achieve that. SGNA, well on the way. We said 300 uh, basis points, so down from 10.5 to uh, 7.5. Uh, we closed the year uh, around uh, 8, so we're 250 of the 300 are in the bag, and uh, this year we'll do the remainder. So we will make our 300 basis points uh, reduction in SGNA, and we'll take it further from there. So again, yeah, check mark, we delivered. On the uh, target margins, we said the target margin for maintenance was three to 5.5%. Uh, we're there, we're at four. Uh, we will improve upon that. You know, we're not sitting back, I'm just saying we delivered. Likewise, engineering technologies, uh, we gave you at the time a target of five to nine, we failed. You know, we're at zero, even a little bit below zero. So if you break it down into the five companies, different story, but we're not complaining. We're just you know, sharing with you our report card, and as Christina said, you know, we are absolutely transparent on this. Finally, on the free cash flow, again, check the box. We said by 18, 2018, we'd be adjusted cash flow positive by 2019. Reported cash flow positive, check the box, 57 million, we achieved it. So what's left uh, is to deliver on the remainder of our commitment. This is why we gave the strategy a little bit of a twist. We would called it now 2020 plus. And uh, early into the, the next plan period, being 20 through 24, we will hit the mark and we will uh, deliver on our financial ambitions. I'm gonna go more into the forward mode and to set the scenes, uh, you know, we have prepared a small film just as a emotional stimulator, but I think it'll give you a little bit of a preview of what I'm gonna talk about and therefore it's a good backdrop. Huh? So with that, if we could show the film, please. At a time when elemental changes are happening at breathtaking speed. Forward-looking businesses need a reliable partner with fresh ideas. Climate change poses a historic challenge. What's called for today are sustainable concepts that will reduce carbon emissions and foster circular economy systems. At the same time, the average age of industrial plants is rising year after year. Maintenance and the ability to extend the assets' life cycles are becoming more and more vital. 
Digitalization is profoundly transforming industrial processes. Intelligent, trend-setting solutions and capable partners are urgently needed. But well-trained and skilled people are getting harder to come by. That means outsourcing services beyond the scope of the asset owner's core competencies will become more common. These trends will shape the future of industries across the world. And they are driving Bill Finger's approach to business. Building on decades of experience, Bill Finger constructs, maintains and modernizes industrial assets across many different regions, all with different requirements. Whether it's extending life cycles, boosting efficiency, or enhancing sustainability, Billfinger has always been linked to the process industry through long-term contracts and cooperation with its clients in a spirit of trust. Based on this comprehensive expertise, Billfinger turns data into value by making plants smarter and more transparent. Innovative solutions leverage the full potential of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, or cloud-based system networking, and pave the way to success for asset owners. Bill Finger's people are its most valuable resource. They're not only well-trained, but also committed and highly motivated. Bill Finger's people work to exacting standards using concepts such as BMC or BTC, which guarantee the highest level of quality and safety. These three factors bring the success of Bill Finger's two business lines to life for asset owners. The portfolio of services covers every link in the value chain under one single brand, Bill Finger. That's what makes Bill Finger the perfect partner in helping its clients meet the challenges of the digital age even better. We make it work. Okay, time to move around a bit. We, uh, when we reviewed the strategy and decided it was the, the way to uh, go forward, uh, we spent some time looking on the global trends, and of course everyone has these, but uh, we focused on the ones that we felt were particularly applicable to us and that would change and drive our business going forward. I think no surprise in the first one, uh, aging assets, asset integrity. Uh, this is, you know, I think no surprise. If I go back to my early days you know, in the North Sea, the assets I worked on then are alive today. They're written off, they're being extended. Uh, the same is on land. So you know, companies are stretching their asset lifetimes. At the same time, they're stretching the assets themselves. They're trying to drive efficiency. They're driving uh, emission reductions. All these are areas where Bill Finger can step in and help. At the same time, as these assets get older, like people, they of course need more maintenance. So the maintenance costs continue to climb. And therefore, this is a prime focus of uh, what we do. What I described uh, covers the asset base in uh, Europe and in uh, North America. If I go to the Middle East, the assets are more like teenagers. You know, they're still young and strong. Uh, the customers paid a lot of money for those assets, so they bought top quality. But those assets are being run by quantity rather than quality. And therefore, when they look at their benchmarking, uh, they see that they're not on a par performance-wise with other parts of the world. Therefore, again, there, they're looking at people like Bill Finger to come in and begin to drive performance. The second driver, ESG, you know, climate change. I think the G part governance, um, you know, we've learned our lesson, we've gone through that, check the box. Social, yes, but environmental, you know, we have a role to play. We help our customers achieve their own goals. So we deliver on uh, reduction of CO2 limits, uh, emissions and air pollutions, uh, clean energy, uh, distributed power generation, power to liquids. We were asked this morning, what is that? It's if a windmill is driving power generation, driving electrolysis to generate hydrogen, for example. That's what power to liquids is. Circular economy, converting waste into materials, into chemicals, or converting waste into power. All of these are projects that we are engaged on today with our customers, helping them achieve their goals. 
We also notice that the flow of finance is changing. People decide where to put their money, and ESG is a prime factor in deciding where that money goes. We like our customers to have money, because then they can give some of that to us. And then finally, of course, is the, the Green Deal. Uh, you will see it coming uh, later on this year from the EU. Again, it will play in this direction. The third trend, and this is not something we make up to drive pricing, this is a fact. Uh, there is a skilled labor shortage. There's one in Europe, driven by demographics, so people getting older. Uh, also driven by the younger generation's appeal to digitalization. You know, they want to go work almost everywhere except in plumbing or welding or in scaffolding. Now, we're very fortunate that we have a good reputation. We can still attract these people. But it is a fact that in Germany, almost a third of these uh, typical skilled labor uh, apprentices positions are empty. In the US, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's not the fact that the people are getting older. It's because the demand is higher. And if you look at the US and look at some of the headlines, you'll see that uh, plumbers are being moved, relocated across country. So a plumber that would have you know, grown up uh, in the town where he was born is now being paid tens of thousands of dollars to relocate to another part of the, the very large US. Yeah. Again, shrinking unemployment is driving that, and that drives a craft labor shortage. We have that craft labor. In the Middle East, I alluded to it, uh, the asset uh, part of our trend. In the Middle East, uh, problems were solved by quantity. If you had a plan that wasn't performing, you threw another 100 people at it. It really wasn't expensive. That's changing. So as they begin to benchmark, look performance, and also begin to squeeze their assets, they're saying we need to upgrade our people. And there, again, Billfinger can help. Finally, I think, uh, again, no surprise, and I think none of these really are a surprise, but these are the ones that uh, drive our business. It's all about data. And uh, you know, data is everywhere. Uh, artificial intelligence in terms of machine learning, uh, that's beginning to you know, have an impact. It's early, but it will have an impact. The machines will learn and replace the experts uh, that we're losing. Predictive and prescriptive maintenance, we've described that uh, already to you. I think virtual reality and augmented reality, you know, combining the virtual world with the real world at the same time, one eye here, one eye there, and then being able to access machine learning to do a better job and drive performance at the plant. We look at OEE, overall equipment efficiency, and again there, as you know, people try to sweat their assets, as they try to squeeze out more from the existing plants, this is where digitalization plays a key role. Also, if you understand your plant and can model the data and predict, it means you have a better handle on risk. And I think uh, understanding risk around plants opens up new business models that I think you'll hear from us a little bit later on in the year what exactly we mean by that. So these are the, the four trends, and I think you'll agree these trends all affect and drive aspects of our business. Yeah. So what do we do with that? Um, well, there are three core capabilities we have that we believe are needed to address those trends, and again, which make building a little bit different from some of our competitors and position us well for growth. So the first, of course, is our very uh, strong, skilled labor base. We are number one in Europe. I'll show you some numbers. Uh, we have a leading reputation as uh, a good employer. Uh, we invest in branding, employer branding, which means we actually go looking for the right uh, recruits before you could sit back and wait. Now you have to go and look for them. We have an academy, so we not only get people, we train them, we invest in those people. That makes them stronger, better, and again, it's an attractive feature of Billfinger as an employer. We have accreditation for our tradecraft. We had, at the end of last year, 34,120 employees. Um, those are full-time employees. At any time, we can add thousands of part-time. We have a very large register of people that want to work only on projects and then go home again. So we have what's needed. We have the skilled labor base. We have domain expertise. Customers like working with us because we're engineers. So we can go into their plant, we can talk to them about processes, we can talk to them about where to drive efficiency, about de-bottlenecking plants. Yeah. They like that interface, and this is also why we like the engineering reputation. Now, we're struggling and fighting with it, yeah, we're not giving up, but I think, again, that's key to our makeup and our credentials vis-a-vis -vis the customers. We focus on the same key industries, uh, you know what they are. We're close to our customers, we're intimate with our customers, we collaborate, and I think the long-term contracts we have, they attest to that. Our longest customers, 75 years they've been with Billfinger. 
Our longest term contract is currently running 14 year contract, Equinor in Norway. And once we win a customer, we rarely lose them. And if we lose them, it's rarely, very, very rarely for quality or not achieving the cost reductions that we committed to. So our stick rate is more than 90%. And something we can do that others cannot do is we can work across borders. So if there's a large turnaround in, um, say, Antwerp, we can mobilize hundreds of people from across Europe to that turnaround. When it finishes and there's a turnaround then in Schwechert in Austria, we can move those people and add to them in Austria. We are cross-border. Not everybody can do that. That makes us a little bit different. And then finally, digitalization. You know, we created Building Digital Next two years ago. It's a startup. It's uh, consuming money. Uh, we planned for that. You know, we said we have a three-year horizon to get to break even. They're on the way. Uh, but what we're realizing is uh, they're actually a very strong marketing weapon. You know, they differentiate Billfinger again from others. And uh, Duncan will point to an example where we won a contract just very recently because we have this. Not because it's doing something wonderful, but because the customer says, you're innovative, you are forward thinking, we want to work with companies like Billfinger. And then we converge the BMC, Billfinger Maintenance Concept. This is our numerically driven approach to doing maintenance, now augmented by digital towards digital BMC. Not only do we try to benefit the customer, we also want benefits from digitalization. And some of the you know, shots you saw in the movie, they're around uh, electronic workflow, where you know, we drive internal efficiency. And if you're on a unit rate contract, you're paid a fixed sum for a pump or a motor. If you can lower your own cost by being more efficient, that's profit. And therefore, again, we use this internal to drive forward our margin expectations. We also have AI. Uh, we have PIGGRAPH, which we've shown a few times. What is PIGGRAPH? You know, these big, you know, A3 uh, size piece of paper that describe a process in a plan. PNID, piping instrumentation diagram. Some of them handwritten uh, changes on them. We can feed that into our PID graph machine. It reads it. It converts it into a process flow and puts that into a computer model. So we're able to, you know, archive old manual uh, process flow charts, but also use that to build digital twins. And then finally, as I said, when you understand risk and how a plant performs and what the consequences of that risk may be, it opens up new models for you. And we're having discussions with a couple of people to see if we can use that to develop new partnerships for building and take us into new business models. But I'm not promising on that yet. It's work in progress. But it shows you there is more under the blanket than meets the eye. So these two dimensions uh, fit together. And uh, we could put a lot of pictures on this chart, but uh, I'll walk you through them. Uh, fabric maintenance, North Sea, that hasn't changed. You know, we're a lead in that. We're very numerical with our maintenance analysis. We build twins in order to drive digitalization and to do predictive and prescriptive maintenance. In terms of um, ESG, climate change, we support our customers, help, their, help them reach their goals. The picture you see here is a circular economy where uh, recycled plastic is being converted into a fuel which is augmented in the cracker feed in order to drive again circular economy. We do something similar with municipal solid waste which is turned into sludge and then again goes through a pyrolysis system to generate power. These are still prototypes and drawing board projects where we support our customer with their targets, their goals. Again, it shows you that we're, I think, a little bit ahead and doing things that some others would like to do. Biomass fired uh, fuel stations, easy. non cellulosic ethanol, yes, doing that too. There's a lot of stuff we're doing around ESG and climate change. Pollution, for many years we've been doing desulfurization in uh, coal-fired power stations. You know the scrubber approach. I'm sure you're gonna have a few questions on that later. But also, you know, we use scrubbers in cement works. You know, just down the road here in Enigalo, we have a project um, where we're actually uh, taking the sulfur out of the cement emissions. Uh, we're being contacted by many customers who are focusing on CO2. And last but by no means least, we do a lot of work on water. The picture you see here is uh, Thames Water. Uh, we're working with them on their efficiency drive uh, in the UK. But we also um, maintain and also operate partly desalination plants in Kuwait and in Saudi Arabia. So we are very present here, and as this develops, we think this will be a very strong driver. We have the answers. You know, we have the people, we have the domain expertise, 
and we have the digital answers in order to put this together as a chain. I mentioned this already, employer of choice, uh, we have the right training and concepts. We can go a little bit further by making the job more interesting through augmented reality. We do cloud analytics, uh, we have AI, and we have now digital BCAP. I think you know, we have the recipe in order to deliver on the kind of strategy that we're showing you here. We then spend quite some time discussing the you know, essential elements like the assumptions. You know, making a plan going forward is fine, but you need to make certain decisions. What are you assuming is going to be a constant through this 20 through 2024 period? And for us, and bear in mind, this is our organic plan. You know, it's not talking about adding to the picture through acquisitions. This is the organic growth plan. We still remain focused on the three key regions. You know, our house that I showed at the beginning is intact. Europe, North America, Middle East. Our industry focus remains the same. Six industries, the top three generate 80% of our revenue. Digitalization, we see as an enabling opportunity. Yeah, not just uh, per se, but enabling, driving productivity internally and opening up new opportunities for partnerships and different business models as we get mature and show that we can really anticipate risk and predict events in plants. We're assuming that we will be engineering and maintenance for a while yet. We're not defining which companies are inside of the technology part. I'm sure that's a question later on too. But again, as I mentioned, there is a good overlap there. There is a credibility aspect to it too. And we think that we can grow further in E&M, strengthen our strength. The war for talent, uh, blue collars, we do make a difference on the market. And we do believe that we will have to fight for good people through the entire five-year period, as do other people. But we think the cards are stacked in our favor. We think we have the right tools to do that. And therefore, this is something that we will continue to do well, I hope. That is attract the right kind of people to deliver on our business model. We then went into the imperatives. You know, what are the essential must-haves we have to deliver? And I know margin, okay, but we also have some other factors, you know, integrity and HSE. You know, we learned the lessons, uh, you know, made through mistakes in 2003. That was a hard lesson, the DPA. It took us five years. Um, I think this is the strongest angered culture element throughout Billfinger. Talk to anybody in Billfinger, all 34,120 people, they will recite to you our compliance rules. We will not compromise on integrity or on HSE. People, attract, motivate, retain, develop. Unique service offering, you know, we want to be able to offer our customers you know, not just one service, but a number of services. We want to be innovative, and we want to, over time, extend our portfolio. We focus on an asset light model. You know, when we uh, were often asked you know, about M&A, um, you know, we have uh, a vision of what M&A looks like. We could describe the animal to you. We couldn't put a name on it because we're not there yet. But what we can tell you is that it would be asset light. We're focused on row C. So row C is one of our primary uh, factors of success. And to drive row C, of course, not only being asset light, but uh, strict working capital management and very disciplined M&A criteria, which Christina will touch more on as we step through the presentation. Margin growth, it's not just you know, pushing for pricing. And of course, as there is a shortage of good people on the market, we've got to be able to push back on pricing. And a lot of our managers over the years have become a little bit soft and let themselves be rolled over by the customer. That's change. It's changing. I was very happy when at the beginning of the year we renewed a contract in Europe and we told them, you're not renewing unless you increase the margin. Uh, at first they were you know, saying, are you serious? You know, customers always expect a, a deduction, a reduction. We said, yes, we're deadly serious. You don't get it. We will not renew the contract. And surprise, surprise, the customer renewed at a higher rate than before. Got to drive that behavior throughout our organization because people are a shortage. We have them. We have good people. We will make a difference. Likewise, uh, project execution. You know, you know my song and dance on that. We're not done yet. Uh, there's room for improvement. And again, we know where to apply that improvement in order to generate the margin pickup that we've promised. 
And then finally, portfolio rotation, something I mentioned last year, not off the agenda. We will continue to look at that, taking out the low performing, but low performing uh, companies, replacing them with more interesting margins. SGNA, not going to go into depth on that. We're on the way. And I think also important is our geographic footprint. Um, we know what to do to grow our business in North America. We want to leverage our existing customers and market position. We want to push more into maintenance using what we have in Europe, but also now with digitalization approach. And likewise in the Middle East, you know, we've been in the Middle East a long time, more than 60 years. And if you look at our revenue base, you know, it's about 80% is energy and utilities. Only about 20% is oil and gas. Surprise. So biggest oil and gas market in the world, we can grow there. We have our first contracts with Aramco. We mentioned that last year, the, uh, the Berry Gas uh, Compression Project. Um, we've just won a great project in uh, Ruwais in Abu Dhabi, uh, working for a well-known customer there. Again, Duncan will touch on it. So it's working. We're on the way to driving our oil and gas profile up from where it was in the Middle East, and that's an essential part of our growth. Now, it is a small part of our business, but nevertheless, it's growth, good growth, and profitable growth. When we sit down with most of you one-on-one -on -one or in other parts of the world, you know, the, the first question that we're always asked by the analyst community is, how do you see the market? You know, what are your customers telling you? And the way that you ask us these questions, you, know, you expect us to come with a negative answer. Sorry, we don't have it yet. You know? Our markets are thus far robust. And you know, if you look at our markets deeper, and I'm sure you do, you know them better than we do sometimes, they are long cycle markets. Yeah? So when they do tip, you know, when there is a recession, we see it coming very early. So our customers you know, go through a longer cycle. We see it coming earlier. We have to react, of course, when that happens. It hasn't happened yet. If we look at some of our main businesses, you know, if you look at uh, the chemical index, the uh, petrochemical global index, in the five year period, 20 through 24, it shows 5.5% CAGR. Now, a lot of that is in the Far East, okay? So if you look at uh, Europe, look at Middle East and North America, it's a little bit less than that, but it's growth nonetheless. That market continues to grow. And really, it's growing with population. Uh, people want to have more chemicals, textiles. You know, population growth is driving the petrochemical business, and it's not going to go down even with a blip in China, as we're seeing today. CapEx, OPEX around uh, EMPs, you know, exploration producing or oil and gas companies. You know, people are saying, well, the oil price is down a couple of uh, dollars. You know, are you feeling it? Yeah? If you look a little bit deeper again, and Total is a great example. Total is a major customer of ours across Europe, you know, in Germany, in Leuna, in uh, Antwerp. And Total, again, you know it better than I do, last quarter, $7.2 billion of uh, cash. That's 20% up on the same quarter one year before. So despite a $2 uh, oil price reduction, you know, they're driving more cash. Yeah? They have their costs under control. They're driving productivity. They're generating cash, and that goes into asset life extensions, making sure that maintenance is working. Our customers, for now, touch wood, you know, are solid. Our industry is robust, and we're confident that we will generate revenue growth going forward for those reasons. The old reasons, asset base. Refineries are old, more than 20 years. If you look in Europe and North America, 60% uh, of those uh, refineries and assets more than 20 years old, they need us. Likewise, uh, they keep adding new ones. It's not that the old ones are being torn down and new ones replacing them. No, the old ones are left and new ones come in addition. And we see 45,000 assets uh, in our space. And we see new projects, even in Europe, which is a mature market, Look at uh, Borealis, look at Ineos investing each a couple of billion in Antwerp again. We're in Antwerp, this is good for us. Climate change, okay, you know the story better than I do. Again, I don't need to dwell on that one. But we're the ones that help our customers reach their climate ambitions. Yeah, and again, today, um, I think it was on Bloomberg, uh, Mr. Looney being interviewed, BP wants to be CO2 neutral by 2050. That's a tall order. Um, happy and waiting for the call. So a few more credentials. Um, we say we're number one in Europe. Uh, we think the European uh, E&M market is roughly 25 uh, billion euros per annum. Uh, if you look at where that money is spent, a large part is in the North Sea. A large part of that is on the UK side. And that's why 
you know, the single biggest market, and we're looking at the, the size of the little factories here that my colleagues put together. Uh, you see the largest factory there, the largest market is in the UK, that's driven by oil and gas. The largest land market, of course, is in Germany, and then so on and so forth. And you see our position. We're number two in the UK. We have some big peer groups in uh, oil and gas. Number one in Europe. Look at the Lunendonk study year for year for year. We're number two in, uh, in Beni, Belgium, Netherlands. Number one in the Nordics. Number one in Poland. Number one in Austria and Switzerland. And we didn't just do that to make Christina happy. That's a fact. So when you put it all together, we believe we are the number one e and company in Europe. As I said, we're a people company. Uh, Bill Finger is a people company. We don't have factories or uh, manufacturing in large scale. We do small modules. We're all about people. And therefore, our people are our, seriously, they are not only our most important asset, they're almost our only asset. And that's why we protect them, nurture them. And if you look at the numbers uh, down here, bottom right, uh, we ended up the year with um, 34,000 120 to be exact. That's down from 35,900 last year, uh, despite higher revenues. So, you know, we're driving productivity. But the main delta there between the 35,900 and the 34,100 on my chart is that we have been selling companies, including large manpower companies in Austria, for example. So, we're focusing on efficiency. And again, if you look at the chart and look at the balance, you know, we have a good mix of white collar and blue collar, again, driving our credentials, working with our customers. And the E part of E&M is engineering. The customer says, I need a modification, I need improvement, I need less emissions. Can you engineer them? Can you implement them? And that's why the two go hand in hand. What have we been doing to uh, protect our you know, most valuable resource? Well, we've done a lot of things and continue to do so. So some of the more recent ones is focusing at the top end on management. And I shared some numbers with you last time. We have changed a lot of managers. Where change management doesn't work, we change management. Critical entities, right sizing, um, that's part of the technology story. It's one of the companies there taking it down to the point where it's right sized, but not you know, too far so it doesn't come its way up again as the orders come in as they're doing now. Hercules, we've invested a lot of money in uh, SAP success factors that we call HRQ list or Hercules. We have the Billfinger Academy. We consolidate LEs because I said it last year also, I think that uh, you know, five times 60 million is not as good as one time 300 million. A stronger management team, stronger uh, delivery model, and of course, a more focused approach to the business. And then finally, SGNA efficiency. You know, it's not just about uh, cutting heads, it's actually being more efficient, you know, checking off the boxes, empowering the people. As we go forward, uh, we have a very active skilled labor strategy. We're beginning to focus more and more on first level leadership. These are foremen and shift leaders, and I'll show you why that's so important. Critical positions remain project managers for execution, but also here, this one, contract manager, in order to claim customers like to take advantage of you. If you're not prepared before you start the job, then you will be eaten for breakfast. And that's happened a few times. As you know, it's going to stop happening in the remainder of the company. Most of it is fixed. Cross-border opportunities, I mentioned that. We can move around, others can't. Entrepreneurial empowerment, Duncan will dive into that one. And pay for performance. Christina mentioned uh, a quarterly approach to cash management in order to get away from this you know, bathtub profile. We want to see you know, four nice peaks through the year, or ideally a flat line. To show you some uh, real numbers and some real um, evidence of what we're doing, uh, this is from social media. You know, this is the kind of thing we do out there to attract the right kind of people. Is it working? That's over here. So we've had uh, 23,500 applicants since we went uh, live with this. And live was uh, at the latter part of Q2 last year. We've made offers to uh, 1,900 of the 23. We are picky. We don't just take anybody. Picky is Christina's word. Um, we've accepted 1,400 uh, people into the company, or rather they accepted to work for us is probably the better way to explain it. That's a 75% hit rate on what we select. And we have in the machine now 30,400 candidates that we can go to. So you see. Employer branding is critical, it's important, and it's part of our makeup. It's what drives a little bit our thinking going forward. 
because this will not change in the next five years. I think I mentioned some of these uh, issues, uh, wage arbitrage. We move people around Europe also for wage regions, and they even like that. It's uh, motivational. Now, the graph on the bottom left of the chart, um, interesting one. The first part, uh, the, the four sites, this is where we actually went in and worked with the, the foreman, the people that have you know, four or five people working for them, building a scaffolding uh, tower, for example. We went in, we spent time with them, we talked about you know, motivational principles, KPIs, morning briefings, performance targets, and after only a very short period of time, we saw a 30 plus percent increase in productivity. And then again, we went forward in measuring that in terms of cubic meters per man hour, a 56% increase in the amount of scaffolding that people can manage. Once you begin to pay attention to the people, give them KPIs, treat them like managers, invest in them, amazing things happen. I'm going to try to finish off with a little bit of where the revenue growth will come from. I've shown you why it will grow. I've shown you why our markets are intact, why we think we have the right recipe and resources to address the markets. Um, our model going forward uh, will sustain 5% CAGA. We commit to that. We see that uh, within our um, you know, geographic horizon, uh, the biggest growth on a smaller base, of course, will come here from North America, rolling out E&M, followed closely by technologies. I think you, know, you understand why. Middle East, 7%, and Europe, our largest base, grow a little bit slower, but we think here this is a profitability challenge, this is a top-line challenge, and all of that together adds up to the 5% CAGA. We've broken it down also by industry, you know, our six focus industries. This one sticks out. That's the Hinkley point effect, okay? And it's also why then, you know, in technologies, there's good growth, Hinkley point coming in, turning from orders in 2020 into revenue in 2021. So with that, um, I'm going to pause. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Duncan, and Duncan will dive a little bit deeper to give you examples that substantiate what I've been showing you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, afternoon, everybody. I'm going to build upon the ideas that Tom put up there, give you some insights into the key activities that we do within the business, and demonstrate our confidence in delivering our targets. We know what they are and we know how to deliver them. So we'll go through this. First of all, before we would do anything, we talk about safety and integrity in our business. It's the core of what we do. It is our license to operate. And all of our employees who are watching this now, they know those values. There's a lot of similarities between managing safety and managing integrity. Strong governance, processes, systems, First and foremost, leadership. Tone from the top, walking the talk. No substitute for that. And our management know how to do this, and we do it day in, day out. In safety, 2019, we had a step change year. Uh, we had two, pro, two periods where we had 104 days without a lost time injury, and 127 days without a lost time injury. A lost time injury is where you can't attend work the day after because you've hurt yourself. Just to give you an idea what that means, give it some reality. 127 days is 40 million man hours. So that would mean you could work for 23,000 years and not hurt yourself. But more realistically, 23,000 of our people could work for a year and not hurt themselves badly. That is world class. That's why you're seeing us in the green. This is a competitive advantage for us. This is why we win work. This is why we don't lose contracts, because our customers need us to be safe. And when it comes to integrity as well, you know, great achievement this year, we signed off the DPA. An enormous amount of work by everybody in the business to achieve this, and we achieved the sign off. So a great milestone for us. But the key to it now in both safety and integrity is this is now part of our DNA. It's part of our operational behaviours. It now drives throughout the business day in, day out. It doesn't have to be driven every day by people in different places. It is part of what we do. But also, what's another part of what we do? We grow and make money. 
That's core cool to our business as well. And if we don't do that, then we're failing. And we are going to grow and we are going to increase margins. The targets are very clear. 5% compound annual growth rate on revenue, 2% increase in our bottom line gross margin. We've made good progress, but we still have some challenges. We know that. Part of this on the top line is winning work at the right price and then delivering it to those prices or better. When it comes to our margin challenges, we actually have two distinct challenges here. We have incremental gains in our engineering and maintenance business. It's stable. Tom's already talked about that. We'll show that again later. So that's incremental management, continuous improvement. But then we have to complete the turnaround within technologies. And we'll visit that again and give you a bit of an insight on some of the things that have happened through there. So I want to take you through some of these examples of how we're doing it, some real life ones, bring it to life a little bit and show you this. And we'll start by how we reduce complexity in the operations at the start of the year. So at the start of 2020, we changed the operating model, made it more compact, less layers. So now the operating units report directly into the COO, CFO. More compact, enabling faster decision making, empowerment into the businesses. A greater focus externally, less internal bureaucracy. Streamline reporting, really got to move that forward quickly without losing the core governance that we have, that we've learned about, but also less approval requirements. Approving the, what, the projects that have the risks, not just that have the value. But we can't just do that. We've also got to make sure we continue to improve and actually accelerate that improvement. As you've seen, we haven't been doing it quick enough. So this is part of the change as well, to introduce what we call the global excellence team. And this team drives growth and it drives margin improvement alongside the daily operations. So this is a team of in-house experts that will ensure in every region there's clarity on the targets and clarity on the actions to grow and increase margin because that's tough when you're delivering every day. So you always need to be pulled back. Remember, this is what we're gonna do. It's not that pretty, it's not that sexy, it's just hard work. So let's have a look at some of these areas that we do. Let's have a look at global development. And this is about the future, it's about securing the future. Yeah, it doesn't happen dramatically quickly. I'll show you some examples though, <laughs> soon, of where we've won work and we're on the journey and the value is to come. So we're in progress here. Part of the key area here on growth facilitating it is we bring our companies together. We have a great portfolio of services and we have a great network where we work. We bring these companies together to provide services to customers that reduce the interfaces. So they have to do less and we do more. And that provides value to the customers. And it provides us both with additional value. We get better margin, they get lower cost. Also, we could talk about digital, and we'll get into a little bit more detail there of where now is the time to deliver on our digital portfolio. We're bringing it into our core offering so that, again, we can drive efficiency, not just for the customer side, but also for our internal side. I'll show some examples of where we've won that. So let's look quickly at that digital landscape and what does it actually mean about bringing together both sides of this. So it's our digital expertise and our domain experience. I'm not going to go down all of them. You'll probably be pleased to hear. Uh, just going to talk about a nice simple example, which is Industrial Tube. It's a great example of where we use the latest technology to make, I still call them videos, make a video put it online, people can learn from them. You can have your glasses out on site and it takes you through how to repair something. And that's been a key tool we've been selling to customers. But it's a key tool in engaging our workforce and improving their skills and improving what they do. And by bringing that in now, alongside what we do, on every contract, we're exposing this to lots of customers who now see it, want it, use it. And you can go down all of these lists whether it's the BMC, the maintenance concept analytics, of where we're able to predict the work more, and not just for the customers, for ourselves, 
as well. It gives us both of these benefits. And when we start looking at the examples of where we've used these, and this isn't theory, this is now reality. The one in the middle there is the best example we've seen so far of where this is, you can see the values. This is a significant contract. Major contract one, one key differentiator, our digital vision. That's not us saying it. That's the customer telling us this is why you got it. Do you see revenue in digital next for that? No, you don't. Do you see revenue in the UK business for it? Yes, you do. Have we got a pathway to improve the efficiency on that, that contract for the customer and for us? Yes, we have. And all of these, as we go through them, you'll see the value is to come. None of these are in the past. I'm not going to show you a single example that's in the past. All value to come. Christina talked about the contract with BP and very politely also pronounced where it is for me. I'm not going to go there. Uh, so this is one of the orders that was delayed from last year into this year. It was secured, signed up January the 15th. Significant value, lower double, triple digit millions, I believe is the sort of phrase that we use. And this was one because we came up with a concept. Two companies from Billfinger, technologies business and the Austrian business, coming together with a concept, a modular concept for manufacture and installation. Why? Reduces the cost. We can do it very efficiently off-site. 180 pipe bridges, longer than these room, this room. 25 kilometers of pipe within them, all manufactured off-site, trucked to the site, lifted in, piece after piece after piece. Minimizes the amount of site work, which is more hazardous and more expensive. And we did that in collaboration with our customer. This wasn't a tender. This was an idea that we built together and went through that design process together. And then we produced a price together. That's by far the best way of getting work, working with our customers. Another area here, again, won't go it. Tom talked about it very briefly in, in Ruace. Our first major maintenance contract in the Middle East. Fantastic. A great job by the people out there to win this. And we won two lots here. No other contracts won two. We won two. First major contract. Why would they give us two? Customer coverage. The major shareholder of that particular asset works with us all across Europe. Has confidence in Billfinger. Knows us. And that's why we're able to do that. First contract, there'll be more to come. Been waiting for this piece. Bit of a project called Hinkley Point. So, we've, we've been talking about this for a long time. We're a strategic supplier to Hinkley Point. We've been receiving orders throughout 2019. Progress has been being maintained. Yeah, we've got lots of work going on. We've got engineers on the ground, we're accelerating it. When will we get the big orders? We got one yesterday. Contract, first big order, 68 million euros was signed yesterday. You'll see it in the press next week. Can't be released because EDF are having their results day tomorrow and don't wish us to do that. They've kindly allowed us to voice that here. So that's the first one. The next big one, which will be the NSSS, where we're already the strategic supplier, that will happen, give ourselves a bit of leeway, half one, but it will happen in half one. Contracts are well drafted, everything is agreed. That's underway. We'll win more work on there, not as sizable as that, but we'll win more work, probably above the estimates that we have here. So we're on the ground, our resources are increasing, we're a key partner to EDF, and we have the first major contract. Let's talk then about, after we win work at the right price, how do we make more money out of it? And it's these differing areas. So first of all, talk about how do we do incremental margin improvement. Deliver the year. Always been the mantra, deliver the year. I just want to pick up on a couple of areas here. Operational KPIs, it's an area we have to do more in. 
to enable us to look forward more, to change what will happen rather than react to what has happened. Whether that's in utilisation or efficiency of our people, we need to be able to plan better how we use them. And this is a key part of what we need to do. An area as well, Tom briefly touched on it, about performance culture. Got examples of both of these to come. And this is about not only the attitude of people, but it's about training them as well in lean processes. How do you drive waste out of the businesses? How do you analyse? How do you look at these things properly? And also, really importantly, rewarding them for success. I get my fun and kicks being in this business by being successful. That's the enjoyment. And lots of other people do as well. And we want to reward them for that. And they want to be successful. And they have the ambition and drive to do that. So let's look at a couple of examples. I'm not going to go through all of these. Uh, let's look at KPIs in action. So uh, Tom already referred to it very kindly. Uh, in Antwerp, uh, this is a total refinery. And actually, the business that operates here is one of our best industrial services businesses that we have. By far one of our best. But we had a contract there was not delivering on margins or delivering satisfaction for the customer. And we weren't happy either, obviously. So we went in, identified the problem, admitted to ourselves we need to improve. Started measuring KPIs down to the basic levels, the daily output. How much are we putting up per hour? How much are we getting back per euro per person? What's the waste? Real detailed waste analysis. Where are we losing time? And start mapping that out. And then when you have those measurements, you can start to standardise the processes of how do you get the logistics right in the morning? How do you get the materials to the right place? You know, we start work at... I do this run with people quite a few times. You know, we start work at 7.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. It could be a horrible day. It could be a beautiful day. You've got to get to site. You've got to put your overalls on. You've got to get your toolbox tour. You've got to get out there. You've got to have your safety briefing. You've got to get put to work. Boom, and you're ready to work. And that takes 15 minutes. Now, you've got 15 minutes to get two tons of scaffold over there. You can't do it. So you've got to do it the night before. Yeah, and these are the logistics and the challenges that not also how do we manage our people, how do we get the customer to manage their process to enable us to do that? Otherwise, we're always going to fight a losing battle. So it's that pushback, working together, customer collaboration. What do we do there? 35% improvement, fantastic. Took us up to a level we can cope with. More importantly, customer gave us two contracts. They saw what we did, they saw how we worked together. Turnaround this year is happening on that site. Just won a three-year extendable by two-year maintenance contract. Same site. That's how you win work. Work with customers, make your performance better, make their performance better. Last one uh, of the examples um, is, is about performance culture. If you remember uh, a few years back, we had the slump in the oil price. Really went down in terms of... Uh, spending within the North Sea, lots of margin pressures. Yeah, and we had to cut prices to keep work. We had to cut prices to win work. And you can't carry on like that. So how do you get back? You have to increase your efficiency. And this can't just come from a few people at the top thinking how they do it. It's got to come from everybody in the business. So this business set off, it was the BTOP program, started this, kicked off. And right from the bottom up came up with some great ideas. And I was, just talk about a couple of them. One of them, quite high level. We had our own in-house training school. We used to train our people within that. And it was great work well. When you've got less people, less work, you've got underutilization. You've got fixed asset assets you're not using and whatever. So what did we do? We got a group of people together, competitors and customers, outsourced our training school. And now that trains people in the industry. No longer a potential underutilization for us and of huge value to the business. Saves us about 500,000 a year. A nice big example, and also makes us more agile. If we take out those underutilization impacts, we are more agile. The other example, one of my favorites. This is, this is, when, this is bottom up. We had a suggestion scheme, suggestion came in. We have transient workers, so they might come in five, six, 10 weeks in the year, very simple statement. 
Why do we give guys who come in for the summer the standard pack, standard start pack? Because it contains a winter coat. As simple as this. How, what, what? We're having people working all summer and we give them a winter coat and they take it home and put it in the garage. And this is one of the lads who experienced this. It saves us £3,000 a year. It's not about how much it saves. It's the attitude that everybody was getting involved. How can we make this business better? And they succeeded. They put 1.9% back on the margin, back on the EBIT line, in a very tough environment. And these guys are number one in industrial services in the UK side of the North Sea. Let's talk about technologies. So, we re briefly referenced, it's five businesses. Three of those businesses are good businesses. They're growing, they're above our average profit. Good, sound businesses. Yeah, in good, high-value markets as we go forward. We've got two that are still challenges. One of them out of the old power units. It's taken longer than we thought to do that. It's been through restructuring. What have we now recently done? We've, at the end of last year, made the decision to exit what is called the performance, conventional power performance market. So this has produced, over the last few years, a number of the legacy projects that we've had and also some of the difficulties. So where we've been taking performance risks for steam and things like that, we've exited. People will be leaving the business. No longer doing that. It's too high risk and there's not the levels of reward the other side. So we're out. That business will concentrate on the nuclear market, and you heard that, Hinkley Point's coming through, the nuclear market's profitable for them. Yeah, a Hinkley Point will keep us going and then there'll be other ones after that. The emissions control market, which isn't just the maritime scrubbers. It is also what we do in the cement. It is also general sulfur dioxide control. Yeah, so again, we have agility in that market to deploy our resources into other places as those markets change. And they do, as everything does. And also, where we are continuing to do industrial work, we are partnering that business up with other Bill Finger businesses. The BP contract referenced before, use the technology skills, but with a great delivery team from within Bill Finger to support as well. Minimise, reduce, eliminate the risks. The other one then uh, is a family-owned business based in France, probably not too difficult to isolate which one it is, and that's had some troubles. Uh, the family left, a lot of management left there, and it left us with some real problems. It left us with a poor order book and processes and systems that weren't up to the task. So we've had to rebuild this. We've got new management in, started at early end next year. They're cleaning it up. Processes and systems are getting in place. We're trading out the low order book and we're gaining control. Here again, there's a small piece of that business that we've exited the market. There, the local petrochemical market is just cutthroat cost plus. We're out. Yeah, it's not worth winning work in that. And that business now, three business lines. Nuclear again, pharmaceutical, and for them, LNG, gas. And all of those, again, high value, <coughs> high margin businesses. So we're making changes in portfolio reducing our risk, but we still have to trade out some of these poor margin contracts that we have. And that will happen in 2020. They'll be traded out in 2020. But the last one around there, and I'm not going to, again, go through every single item on this. So where did we start and where are we now within technologies? There's been a lot of changes. On the delivery piece, we have changed people. We've changed the leadership at divisional level, so a new executive president and a new finance director. We've changed leadership in the two businesses that are struggling. We're bringing in partnerships to help with the delivery end. And we're strengthening our front end to make sure we estimate properly. Proper stage gate processes to make sure we have the right prices and then the right processes to deliver. Sounds easy. It's tough. We get in there less mistakes, 
more ambition, more confidence coming back in those businesses. And then when it comes to weak margins, we're exiting those problem sectors. We're exiting those areas. Stay in three high-value sectors. Yeah, with growth potential, nuclear, pharma, emissions control, and a bit of gas within France. So where does that leave us? Now, I'll slowly take you through this. So here is our gross margin achievements. This is what we do. This is right now. And we show here, these are our activities. Engineering, industrial services, so insulation, scaffold, painting, the maintenance work, multi-service, construction. And here's our target line for gross margin. And you can see 85% of our revenues are on, around, or above our target margin. This is where incremental margin improvement works. Under control, yeah, low volatility on the margins, you can build. We keep contracts, you can grow. It's very hard to grow when you're losing contracts. We keep them. So this area, solid. Careful I don't trip over. In the auxiliary area, talked about it, there's two types of businesses in here. There's some that we tried to make work, we brought them back to okay margin performance, but they're not going to get any better, and they're probably best being with another owner. So we've moved them into our OP, and we'll look at making sure we can get the best price we can for them. There's others that still remain here. Margins are slightly low, but they have a place because actually customers need these services. And we need to change how we sell them and start to link these up with some other areas of the business. Otherwise, some of these areas won't be able to win work. Insulation being a particular challenge in there, making money in insulation. You link it up in the full cycle within the scaffold areas as well and painting. Then we have technologies. The margin potential is still there, and we see it. We just get dragged back by the challenges that we have and the failures that we have. And we've got to reduce those and eliminate those. We have the people in place to do that. We have the processes in place to do that. There'll still be the occasional stumble, but we're well on the way to doing this. So very, very briefly, <coughs> that's why I'm confident. Woo, these, guys, <laughs> these guys are confident. We've got the actions in place. Get the gross margin to 12%. And then we'll see where we go after that. 2% on the gross margin by 2021, and then we move on. OK. Over to Christine for some financials. So I'm sure you are almost grounded after one and a half hour in there. Uh, but we tried, especially Tom talking about our key markets, oil and gas, chemical and petrochemical, um, utilities and energy, how they are developing, what they will require going forward. Also trying to uh, tell you how we see our role um, being uh, in Europe the market leader in what we are doing and the opportunities to also adjust our portfolio to even better meet the requirements and the needs of our clients. And then, of course, Duncan talking about how we are very committed are very prepared to make sure that we deliver the year 2020 and secure profit and growth by on 2020. So where will this journey then lead us? And our planning period is, of course, by on 2020. It's 21 to 24, even if we are digging deeper in 2020. Um, and then we have target setting, ambitions and plans uh, for the next coming years. So looking at the financials going forward, our ambition, our plans are built, as I said before, closing the last two years with an organic growth of 6%, now expecting a flat top line for 2020. And then from 2021 to 2024, we are committed to deliver a 5% organic growth every year, year on year. That will take us, as Bill Finger, organically b b above the 5 billion revenue line. On the EBITDA side, closing at 2.4% in 2019, now guiding 
and being committed to deliver a big step up to 4% in 2020 and then 5% from 2021. And you see here a commitment that we will be in line with 5% and then above the 5%. Looking at numbers, we will exceed the 250 million EBITDA. You also see down at the bottom end the EBITDA reported. Um, and here you see that we are from quarter one convinced and committed to deliver one EBITDA. So we will have a um, smaller amount, and I come back to that, of adjustments also in 2020 and then facing out in the first quarter of 2021. So leaving the adjusted and the reported world to one real EBITDA. On the free cash flow reported, we see the 57 that I mentioned for 2019 and taking this year by year up to above 200 million in 2024. This is our commitment. This is what we are working hard on. And this is what is motivating and driving us to really keep our promise, not only for the last two years, but also going forward. Looking at the two main drivers, um, we have spoken a lot about the need to improve our gross margin, that we closed at 9.5% in 2019, and in the next coming two years, we are taking up to 12%, and thereafter, even above 12%. How do we do that? We do that with a more solid execution, more commercially driven, but a better contract management from the beginning, setting the scene so that we are making sure that the contracts are set up in such a way that we will generate more and better margins. But also making sure that claim management, which is an essential part of project management, on a continuous basis actively is driving us forward. But also what was mentioned being, what I say, a bit picky in good markets with good growth that we are making sure that we are driving for the right contracts and that we sometimes also have the strength to say no thank you if some of the contracts are not offering the opportunities to get up to the 12% even if we do our utmost. Utilization in a people's business is essential. Also working harder on making sure not only due to our seasonality but also in general that we have solid, better, stronger utilization rates. On the SGNA ratio, continue to build on the success that we have delivered, getting this number from 8% last year down to 7.5 this year, and then to 7% or even below in this planning period. And how do we do that? We continue to do it in the same way as we have done so far. We try to be more efficient in the organization, to be leaner. We try to continue to reduce the number of legal entities because that will take out complexity and improve efficiency, economy of scale in a lot of the SGNA areas. But also making sure that the system harmonization with the same joint IT support will be finalized and that we utilize that joint platform more and more efficient. This we have done, this we continue to do. Looking at the special items, and I'm picking out the two main items here. I said to you that in 2019, we spent or we had 40 million for restructuring and a bit more than 30 million for the IT or system harmonization. Looking now at what is left to come on adjustments. What is left to come on PL? It's 30 million. We are expecting that. We will have a little bit of restructuring, as you always have, um, in a transformation, but much smaller amounts in 2020. And then we will have the finalization of the rollout of ERP, our SRP <coughs> platform, also then having an impact on 2020, and a small part, 5 million in 21. So these are the adjustments we are expecting in the next coming two years, phasing out. There is, as always, a certain delay in the cash effect, 
So as I said, we provided and took in the P&L effect of the restructuring in 2019. Most of the cash effect we will only see in 2020 as we implement um, our plans. So this is our commitment in regard of adjustments and then from quarter two 2020, one single real EBITDA. SGNA efficiency, I mentioned the continuous drive to reduce the number of legal entities to reduce complexity and lower the overheads. You see here our track record. We had 279 legal entities in 2016. We closed last year with 160 and we are confident with what we are doing right now that we will get below 150 by the end of this year. Um, right now, we are merging entities in US, we are merging entities in the Netherlands, trying to drive for less complexity. But of course also, if you have larger entities, you will also have more skilled people. You can afford to have more professional people focusing on different tasks. Looking at the system harmonization, we finalized the HR platform, the project that we call Hercules last year. So the rollout was finalized in December 2019. We are well on the way for also the ERP, the SAP implementation. We have decided, based on our experience in the rollout, to expand the scope. Originally, 66% of our total revenue was foreseen for SAP. We have now expanded that with 28%. So when we have finalized the rollout, we cover 94% of our revenue with the SAP joint platform, which is helping also the integration. It is helping us to work together. We had a number of projects, Hinkley Point, BP, Gelsenkirchen, where companies from different Bilfinger countries are working together. Having the same system platform is making it so much easier and so much more efficient. Looking at the rollout here, we have done 70% by the end of 2019. We are planning to have 90% of it done by the end of this year. So also here, proceeding in accordance with our plan. And last but not least in regard of the system harmonization, it is extremely important for the, for the uh, transparency to make sure that you really talk about the same things. You have the same definitions, <laughs> talking about this entity and technologies that hurt us so badly in the first half of last year, only when SAP was implemented, we got full transparency of the projects. So not only efficiency and cost saving, it's also about transparency. Looking then at our, what I call bread and butter, our e &M, our engineering and maintenance segment. And these numbers you see in the reporting, we are simply adding up the segment e &M International and e &M Europe. That brings together almost 3.7 billion of our sales. Here we are convinced that we will continue to grow. So from 2021, we will see 5% organic growth in our bread and butter e &M business going forward. Looking at the profitability today, if you add up the results here, you will see that we last year we're around 4% EBITDA adjusted in e &M. And this, we are obviously then taking up above 5% until 2024. But of course, this journey will go faster. So the 5% will tick in here during the next coming two years. I think in e &M, it will not even require that we get to the end of 2021 before we see the stable, sustainable 5%. This is very much what we are good at and we need to strengthen our strength. Working capital management, a story that never comes to an end. If someone working on this is taking more than two weeks of holiday, I see the traces. That's the hard thing. Um, working capital for us today is a bit different than it used to be because the old Bilfinger was having a very good working capital thanks to very, very high prepayments from the construction business. That's over. The amount of prepayments in our business is actually year on year because the clients are more conscious about cash 
reduced. But nonetheless, we are trying to use the opportunity for payments in projects wherever we can. Accounts receivable, we have very solid clients. When they get the invoice, they normally pay on time. We can't complain that we are losing money on bad payers or on companies that are not surviving. So the main area for further improvement here is the work in progress. That is generating 32 days of the 74. And how can we improve that further going forward? Awareness, cash has also got a price tag. So all the projects, they do not need just to pass the profitability. They also need to pass the liquidity and the cash planning. Looking at contract and claim management, that should be a um, fundamentally important part of our business and of project business in general. We have recently started to employ more and more people specialized on contract and claim management to give this more focus. That will help us to reduce the VIP, to set the contract in a different way, but also to drive the claims during the projects and not only at the end of the project. We also look, of course, at any possibility to improve our payments term in the contract area. And of course, the clients do the same, but the awareness that cash is also with a price tag, that's something that we have been driving this culture and we continue to drive. Of course, on the DPO side, we see the 69 days that we, I think, quite healthy achieved by the end of December. That is a number that we also continuously need to get up. I don't want to say how far we can get it because that depends also on the amount of large projects that we have. But by making more and more procurement together, increasing the bundling, but also work on the rates here, I'm sure that we will also be able to improve our track record on the DPO side. And as also mentioned, our SDI system has been adjusted this year to not only measure the performance at the end of the year, but to measure it on a quarterly basis. Looking at our <coughs> financial model, um, we want to be, and we are, a low-risk business with a recurring business, with a strong focus on Europe and a diversified customer base. We have a number of large customers, but we are not depending on one or two. So this is our profile. We are representing a sustainable revenue growth. Back to the 5% organic growth again from 2021. And obviously the last years with even 6% organic growth per year. Starting to look at bolt on acquisitions because not only because of having the funds, but also having the stability in the company to successfully be able to integrate any kind of bolt-on acquisitions. We want to achieve industry-leading margins. So the 12% gross margin, the 7% or even below 7% of SGNA ratio, these are industry-leading margins. And a strong cash generation, a very asset light model. In 2019, we had a net capex of as low as 50 million. So also a strong awareness how we spend the capex, a strict working capital management, a high free cash flow that then can be utilized for dividends or bought on acquisitions. This is our financial model. Looking at capital allocation priorities. On one hand side, we have a situation where Billfinger is um, rated by S&P at double B with a stable outlook. But we are clearly committed and are working hard over the next coming years to get Billfinger back to an investment grade. That requires that we are fulfilling the criteria, and I have listed some of them here. And if you look at 2019, we are not yet meeting these criteria, if we are achieving what we have set as our target for 2020, we will be there. But it will take a little bit longer because it has to be a sustainable track record to bring us back to investment grade. But next time when we go for refinancing, we want to have an investment grade to also get a more attractive interest rate when we are 
going for the next funding. We have a clear dividend policy during the last years and also for 2019 we are suggesting the floor dividend of one euro to give something to our shareholders in the transformation. But we are committed to then continue from 2020 with a 40 to 60 percent of adjusted net profit. Making sure that the fact that we will have some cash will not send us out on a shopping tour making things that will not make sense. We have very strict M&A criteria for those targets that we are looking at. EBITDA, accredited one year after integration. ROSI exceeds VAC two years after integration. Asset Light with focus on ROSI, as Tom said, an immediate start of integration when acquired. Very strict criteria, not always easy to fulfill, but uh, based on being a conservative Swiss CFO, I think this will make sure that any acquisitions that we make will be successful. We have learned our lesson from uh, what Bill Finger did 10 or 15 years ago, and we should. Um, focus in the M&A strategy. Of course, we have started a bit more actively to look at this, as we also believe that we are now stable enough to um, have a clearer look at what would make sense. Um, bolt on M&I priorities would be core geographics, where we see that a combination of an acquisition and organic growth would bring us much faster ahead. But also core industry, where we, as a potential new owner, see clearly strong synergies that would justify that we would um, make an acquisition. And I also would have a close look at the margin. It doesn't mean that these companies have to be at 12%, but we need to know exactly how we, within 12, 15 months, can bring these targets to a 12% or even beyond 12% operating margin. Sources of funds beyond our own ability to improve our cash generation is, of course, the fact that we have the 49% investment in Apleona, where the market and rumours are saying that EQT will try to sell that. And we know that we have a balance sheet position of 240 million. By the way, the same amount as we have showed previously, so we did not adjust in the last two quarters anything. Um, 240 million, which we regard to be a conservative number if EQT would trigger and sale and Apleona would be sold. So these are the funds, our own ability, spending less on working capital, improving the profitability, spending less on adjustments, and then to some extent, if the money for Napoleona is coming in, these will be sources of funds that could be used for a justifiable M&A. Of course, could be used, but I also try to convince that we're not going to spend the money for the sake of having the money. We will have very, very strong criteria before we are going ahead and making further acquisitions. But we are convinced in the management team that there are acquisitions that really would bring a strong um, additional value also for Billfinger and also to the shareholders. With that, I would like to get back to Tom to summarize. Thank you, Christina. This will be quick uh, because you know, you've seen it already. 246 lives, so we stick by our guns. Our strategy is working. Um, You've seen the uh, assumptions behind it. And for those of you that are very eagle-eyed, you'll see that we did give a little twist here in the middle. So rather than four regions, we have four business units, Europe, North America, Middle East, and technologies. Also, our recipe to win people, assets of our customers, and data. We shared with you our view of the world, so our global trends, uh, the ones that we think are applicable to Bill Finger. We shared with you our key competencies that we use to answer these trends. And with that, you know, our assumptions and even more important, our imperatives. And these together make our strategy going forward 2020 plus effective 2020 through to 2024. 
We shared with you a lot of data and facts. Uh, these are not made up. These are real numbers. And we evidenced that with many examples, especially from Duncan's section. We showed you uh, the Fingers of People company, and I think uh, the message on margins is quite clear. This is our biggest uh, focus going forward, and it's why we are going to deliver on our commitments and on our targets. That's why we say we're going to be predictable, reliable, and sustainable. It's not a one-off effect. It's a continuing sustainable effect. And again, those are the numbers that Christina showed you. When we do that, then this is what it yields. So again, you've seen the numbers in the uh, various parts of Christina's uh, section. 5% uh, CAGA will take us over the 5 billion organic in uh, 2024. We are going to have a baseline minimum EBITDA reported of 5%. Why do we call it a minimum baseline? Well, we see businesses will fluctuate with cycles. You know, we're not immune. We see them coming a little bit earlier. We have more time to get ready. And if we can exceed the 12%, remain under the 7, you, know, you do the math, we're a little bit above 5, and we leave that leeway for good times and maybe not so good times. But that is the minimum threshold we want to achieve going forward in a sustainable sense. The ROC focus we've talked about, that will yield significant cash flows. How we use them, um, again, opportunity driven and uh, what happens at the time. But important is, of course, if we do all that, we want to be investment grade, so BB plus, And we want to be known as a reliable company that delivers on dividends in the range of 40 to 60 percent of adjusted net profit. So with that, the last slide, the obligatory slide, uh, you know, we create. We care we can, and we make what we showed you, we make it work. Thank you.